the world to come. The Restored Church of God presents David C. Pack, answering life's greatest questions straight from the Bible and announcing the wonderful good news of the world to come. This is part two in a series examining whether Christians vote and participate in politics. We began by looking at certain scriptures and biblical principles, as well as how the world came to be as it is. We also asked whether Jesus would vote and why he was not active in government. Of course, Christians follow his example. The Bible commands, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Each additional proof from Scripture reveals more of why Christians never participate in the governments of this world. It will also become obvious why voting is never practiced within God's church, the true church. As we examine scriptures, consider why each has a clear application to men's governments. Part two will be difficult to appreciate if you missed the foundation in part one. Here now are nine more biblical principles Proofs explaining why true Christians avoid all involvement in politics. Proof or principle number one concerns the fruits, the byproduct of any system or leader. Jesus stated, You shall know them by their fruits, and, Wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. He also taught, For the tree is known by its fruit. These verses are primarily speaking about leaders, but the principle has broad application. Let's examine the fruits of the tree called politics, voting, and democracy. This system is based on competition between political parties. Each party seeks to gain an advantage over the other and will even undercut good ideas if it will cast a bad light on the opponent. During the period preceding an election, called election year politics, the challenger opposes the incumbent at every turn and on virtually every issue to present himself as different and in the best light, solely to get elected. Over time, this has a devastating effect on the unity of a country that is supposed to stand behind its government. This openly and often bitterly divides the citizenry of any nation. Democracy is the form of government in three-fourths of the world's nations. Think of just some of its fruits. Favoritism, endless debates and arguments, bribes, lust for power, corruption, lying and deceit, scandals and cover-ups, greed, exploitation, maneuvering and manipulation, relentless accusation, inefficiency, vanity, decisions based on polls, voter apathy, strife, and backstabbing. All democratic politics are literally shot full of division and disagreement over nearly every issue that arises. The fruit of democracy is chaos. So then, no follower of Jesus Christ can participate in such a system. Proof number two is short, simple, and easy to understand. Study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single instance where balloting of any kind was used to select a leader. Nowhere can you find people electing New Testament ministers or Old Testament priests. And the Bible is the pattern Christians are supposed to follow in all matters. They are to live by every word of God. And God's word neither authorizes nor reflects any pattern of voting. Proof three is longer and presents a central biblical understanding that few recognize. Consider these questions. Who is behind the selection of leaders over the many countries of earth? Who actually chooses them? Ultimately, do men select presidents and prime ministers who stand as the human leaders of nations today? We saw this as Satan's world. But is this the whole picture? Does God play a role in men's affairs? Benjamin Franklin once said, The longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, the Bible does say this, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? Let's ask, was Franklin correct? 
A little known but remarkable passage flies in the face of what every voter thinks upon casting his ballot. Notice, this matter is to the intent that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. Note this, and sets up over it the basest of men. Base means the bottom, under. Basements are at the bottom of or under the house. The context in Daniel involves a prophecy about King Nebuchadnezzar, who may have been the greatest Gentile leader the world has seen. This ruler led the world's most powerful empire 2,600 years ago. Daniel called him the head of gold of the giant image that was spoken of in chapter 2. But Nebuchadnezzar became filled with pride. Let's read. The king spoke and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? This worldly king was impressed with his own accomplishments and the grandeur of the city and kingdom of Babylon that he ruled. The Bible records that God humbled and punished him by giving him the mind of a wild beast for seven years before restoring him. Nebuchadnezzar was an exception to the rule of Daniel 4.17, and there are a few exceptions that God guides for his own reasons. Think of Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, and Winston Churchill. But he declares that he places the basest of men over the governments and nations of earth. Daniel also recorded, God removes kings and sets up kings. Now, typically, whom do people seek to elect? The thought to be best candidate. No one votes thinking their choice is the worst candidate. If we believe Daniel 4.17, this puts them in direct opposition to God's purpose, which is the basest man wins. The lowliest, weakest people are those whom God installs into office. Again, Nebuchadnezzar shows God makes exceptions, but this is his prerogative, not ours. Do not misunderstand, however. The governments of this world are not somehow doing God's will simply because he selects their leaders. Many preachers completely miss the point saying God is working in this election and good Christians everywhere, if we get out the vote, can put godly men into office. This literally puts them in a position of fighting God's stated purpose. They do not understand why God says the basest are elected. Just one reason is that God gives a world that rejects him the leaders they deserve. Religious leaders ignore this verse, believing it their job to work out God's purpose. Their efforts actually attempt to override God's purpose. God is working out a master plan, and it encompasses 7,000 years. He is allowing man to learn that his own ways, governments, religions, educational systems, values, and purposes do not work. God has already picked the leaders that best work toward the fulfillment of His plan, which involves salvation for all mankind, a subject of other broadcasts. Here's the point. You and I do not know whom God has already selected in advance to win. To vote for someone other than the pre-selected winner is to fight God's purpose. That is serious, and the Bible says it is possible to fight against God. True Christians know to get out of the way, not get out the vote. God needs no help installing His choice. The will of the people has no power or effect because God determines the outcome of elections. Proof 4 involves a famous conversation. Jesus was on trial before Pontius Pilate, who asked, Are you the king of the Jews? The exchange climaxes with, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence, meaning from here, from this world. Understand Christ's words. His government is not of this world. Christians represent God's government. They await this government's arrival. Also, just based on this verse, Jesus explains God's servants do not fight in war. Grasp this. 
since Christ's servants do not even fight to defend Christ's or God's government, they would certainly never do so to defend any kingdom or government led by men in any so-called just war. You should carefully read this booklet, War, Killing, and the Military. God's kingdom comes from and is headquartered in heaven. It is not the job of His servants, through participation in men's governments or fighting in their wars, which the Bible plainly condemns and in many passages, to supposedly spread the kingdom of God. Related to this, activist churches involved in and trying to influence this world's governments are not backed by Jesus Christ. No amount of human reasoning can make it so. Christians do not vote because they are part of another kingdom. Jesus told them to pray, Your kingdom come. His followers serve and look toward that kingdom now just ahead. It comes only when Jesus returns. Proof 5 builds on this. We saw in part 1 that our conversation, the Greek means citizenship, is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a fascinating passage, and it complements John 18, 36, and explains why Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. The Christian citizenship is held in heaven, not on earth. Of course, Christians are also citizens of countries on earth. But this is not their primary citizenship. We saw that the Greek word for citizenship is polit yuma. Politics derives from this word, as do Indianapolis and Minneapolis. So do police, policy, and poll. And it's easy to see how these three are connected in one way or another to politics. Mysteries often stripped away when words are broken down. The meaning of polit yuma carries a vital message to Christians regarding from where and by whom their politics are governed. Let's ask, do God's people practice politics? The answer is yes, in a sense. Christians do have a political agenda, but not of this world or in any government within it. I will tell you that I have absolutely deep political convictions. This said, is God political? The answer is absolutely yes, but his politics are not of this society, man's civilization of nations and governments. He has his own view of government, his own view of politics. Of course, while not of this world, God does have a government. Human leaders come from a certain city, state, or province of the country they represent. The ultimate leader of God's church, Christ, is in heaven. Proof 6 summarizes the last three proofs. Notice, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. No person can give equal allegiance or loyalty to two masters of any kind. Jesus was actually teaching about seeking God versus the accumulation of money at the same time. Eventually, one takes precedence over the other and dominates the thinking of a person. Christians are to be totally loyal to the heavenly government they represent as ambassadors for Christ. As with ambassadors of earthly nations, they cannot participate in the politics of any country other than their own. In the world, violators can lose their citizenship at home. God's servants must in every circumstance, when there is conflict, obey God rather than men. Now let's understand this. If one is a citizen of a government waiting in heaven to replace all earthly governments, he cannot stand with his feet resting in two opposing governments, God's and man's. I repeat from part one. True Christians never disobey or resist civil authority unless that authority directly instructs them to disobey the higher authority of God. Read Acts 5 and verse 29. And they do not even attend protests or demonstrations of any kind, not ever. They are not anti-government, 
and pay all their taxes. However, like Jesus, they are not activists in civil affairs trying to fix or improve society or make men's governments more godly. They know this cannot be done. But they also know that participating in government and submitting to it are separate matters. They yield to men's governments as very models of obedience. Romans 13, 1-7, and other scriptures make clear what God expects. So does our article, Should Christians Submit to Government Authority? Proof 7 involves God's view of division. He wants his people together and enjoying unity and harmony. And he plainly says this, notice, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is a wonderful thing when people get along, when they agree. God hates division and discord. Notice this powerful verse. Mark, meaning take note of them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. Here is another strong passage. These things does the Lord hate, he that sows discord among brethren. Involvement in politics would bring division and discord into the church. How? You've heard that there are two things that should not be debated, religion and politics. God's people never push Jesus or his teachings in politics or religion at people. Few things are worse, and Christ condemned this. Violating this principle in politics or religion always leads to arguing, strife, fighting, and even war. We learned in part one that Satan's world is cut off from the God who teaches the path to peace, harmony, and unity. What if the brethren of God's church did vote in worldly elections? First, some, either few or many, would select someone other than whom God wanted. Again, and worse, voting automatically introduces division. The prophet Amos asked, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Soon enough, most people learn the painful answer is no. Political disagreement breeds division and eventually splits countries, cities, neighborhoods, and families, and also congregations and whole churches. The Apostle Paul asked, is Christ divided, meaning is his church divided? The obvious answer is no. Recall that Jesus said every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. A divided professional football team cannot expect to win the Super Bowl. A baseball team cannot be torn with strife and win the World Series. Divided families eventually fracture. The same is true of countries. The Church of God could hardly be different. Would Jesus say that all other organizations or entities cannot be divided and survive, while the most important one, the Church He directs, could be an exception? To be the very epitome of unity and harmony, he would never exempt his church from this principle. This is but one reason he said the gates of hell could never defeat the church. Have you wondered why the world's churches are so many, so divided, and why they compete for members? Because they cannot agree on doctrine or administration. People must agree or there will be division in every endeavor. Politics is no different, and the only politics God's servants participate in are the politics of God. Proof 8 addresses the system that true Christians avoid, and at all costs. Speaking of this Babylonish world, God commands, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. He also commands, Come out from among them, the world, and be you separate. Babylon means confusion. The true servants of God have come out of this world and its Babylonish religions, governments, and ways. They have left behind its teachings, division, strife, and confusion. Let's understand. Just before his crucifixion, Jesus reflected in a prayer a central principle 
to his disciples. I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word, the Bible, is truth. Real Christians believe and follow the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth of God's word, and not men's ideas about it. The truth sets them apart, sanctifies them from everyone around them. They are not of this world and its ways, customs, beliefs, and traditions. They have come out of it, leaving all of its values, ideas, and philosophies behind. Thus, they would never seek political office and its corrupting ways. Obviously, a Christian cannot live on Mars or in a cave or as a hermit on a mountaintop. Some religious zealots misunderstand Christ's words and live in monasteries or retreats to avoid contact with people. Jesus never did this. He did not mean come out of the physical world, but rather its system of governments and religions. Christians practice and believe the truth, not popular ideas, any of them. We might ask what may seem an unusual question. But the implications are very real for the future. What if God's people were voting and participating in democracy in Europe as the beast of revelation arises? This political, economic, military, and religious power will come soon and is already rising. Voting would literally be helping to establish the final world-dominating counterfeit government and religious system foretold to deceive the world and fight Christ at his return. Think, would God allow his servants to participate in the rise of this evil counterfeit religious civil government? Would God instruct his servants in Europe to separate from Babylon but permit them to participate in the very system? still democratic today, that will select the super dictator who leads it and who will fight Christ? Of course not. Now the ninth and final proof that Christians do not vote, seek office, or participate in politics. Some candidates for office want to be a mayor, others a congressman, governor, judge, or senator, and still others president or prime minister. But ask, what are political candidates saying between the lines when presenting themselves for an office? What are such people saying about themselves? Focus on the higher offices of governor or president. The candidate is saying that he is qualified to be a powerful leader. Think about it. Such people seek to elevate themselves to great authority. The candidate is saying he is sufficiently intelligent, talented, qualified, educated, experienced, and wise to be trusted with awesome responsibility. Of course, no one puts it this way. But the person is saying, like Nebuchadnezzar, I am a great leader, and the masses should hand me great power. Voters directly assist such power-hungry, self-serving egotists in their climb to authority. Here is Jesus' perspective. For whosoever exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. One look at the greedy, grasping demagogues who are modern politicians with their pandering theatrics designed to play to the people's concerns, and this is just as true of religious leaders, and you will see that Jesus understood the corrupting nature of self-exaltation. He sees through the guise of phony concern for the people whose votes these leaders must get to receive the power they covet. Christians are to humble themselves now in this life. Many passages emphasize this. This will allow God to exalt them later in his kingdom, where they will rule alongside Jesus Christ in permanent positions of infinitely greater power and authority than any human office. Politicians exalt themselves and thereby ensure God will humble them at some later time, usually when they least expect it. Christians understand the way God works. 
to participate in a system in which men exalt themselves is to endorse, to validate, to agree with a corrupt system with terrible fruit based on pride and driven by arrogance. Now what about various forms of politics in churches? Some ask. I realize God doesn't want us participating in politics, but isn't it all right if church leaders' doctrines and traditions and budgets are decided by ballot? Is it not proper to vote on these things, particularly as long as we pray about it in advance and ask for God's guidance? We already saw the Bible says nothing whatsoever about voting to elect leaders, decide doctrine, spend money, or anything else. Asking God to guide a process He reveals is not how He works is foolish, and worse is rebellion. To do something, anything that is wrong and then ask God to bless it, is a charade God sees through. It asks Him to endorse what He has explained in many verses is wrong and therefore sin. Church politics are a little different from civil politics. Many passages you have seen just as directly apply to churches. Their application is obvious. While the universal church at Rome uses a designated college to elect its leader to a lifelong term, other denominations similarly elect through congregational or Presbyterian style government, but just for shorter periods. In all cases, underlings elect the leaders over them. This means they retain the power to remove or unelect leaders who do not deliver on the expectations of those who installed them. Pastors can be hired and fired by councils of deacons, elders, or others under them. Such pastors must preach what the people want to hear in lieu of what they need to hear or they will join the unemployment line. The tail wags the dog. In most denominations, on the national or international level, election of leaders and approval or rejection of doctrine is subject to votes by councils or conferences of ministers. Since these organizations do not practice God's hierarchical method of government from the top down, it is of no use that they pray about decisions or ask God to bless their actions. They have not selected God's chosen leader, but rather their own. They have not adopted God's doctrines, but rather the will of the majority. Just as much as leaders of democratic nations, such church leaders are governed by the will of the people who installed them. Running for a church office, asking for support, and practicing degrees of politics to get it are no less practices of Satan's world than in a civil setting. The honest person will admit that such councils, conferences, and church boards reflect the same fruits of democracy as civil governments. Jesus Christ did not build this world's divided, competing, disagreeing churches any more than He built the world's divided, competing, disagreeing nations with their governments. God is not leading these churches. The churches of this world simply do not have and do not practice God's truth on the matter of government or much of anything else. For more detail, you may read our booklet, Should Christians Vote? You'll be glad you did. But here also is a thorough book you may wish to read written as a special instruction and warning to God's people, the government of God, understanding offices and duties, is like no other book. Jesus Christ and His one church are not divided. The fruits within this church found all over the world are unity, harmony, happiness, and zeal, among other positive effects. God's people do not participate in men's governments, and, sanctified by the truth, have come out of the world and its churches built on the ideas of men. They represent and await the arrival of the greatest government the world has ever seen, now coming soon. Until next time, this is David C. Pack saying goodbye, friends. This program was made available by Restored Church of God members and donors from around the globe.
Explore our vast library of literature and other World to Come programs, which are all made available free of charge. To learn more or to find a local congregation, contact us to receive a personal response from a minister.